report on this computer and I've got it going. Okay, and I will also save this recording and I'll put it on Blackboard tonight for those who did not catch up with us. I want to start off this evening by discussing England. The Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and the Dutch were way ahead of England getting started on exploration and building colonies. And a lot of problem had to do with Elizabeth and of course King Henry and all the drama that took place in England during the 1500s. They had all kinds of problems. King Henry had married uh, the, the, his sister-in-law, her name was, uh, her name was uh, Catherine of Aragon. She was promised to his older brother, Arthur. They got married, Arthur died. And they held her in England until King Henry reached the age of 16, so he could marry this 26 year old. And of course they had problems. That she could not have babies that he wanted. He wanted male heirs to the throne and Catherine never produced an heir. She finally had Mary Tudor and Mary Tudor did survive, the only child they had to survive. And then, of course, he goes after Anne Boleyn, and he goes after Jane Seymour and all these different ladies that, he, that he's going to be married to. And, of course, he's going to have most of these ladies beheaded. Uh, right behind Mary Tudor is going to come Elizabeth as Anne Boleyn's baby. And then Jane Seymour had Edward, the only son. And when Edward was born, <clears throat> King Henry declared him to be a bastard child. That's a good father. Or he declared the girls to be bastard children. I'm sorry, he declared the girls to be bastard children. And of course, he made sure that Edward would go to the throne of England once he had died. The only problem is Edward did not live very long. He died from the flu. I got a feeling the poor kid was poisoned. Mary Tudor comes in as, king, as queen of England. She causes a war to break out between Puritans and Catholics. And that's a big mess. She dies. And then here comes Elizabeth. And of course, Queen Elizabeth never got married. She's a virgin queen, as she called herself. And of course, you know that she played the game. She was out there doing all kinds of craziness. And uh, she is the one who should have started the colonies in the, late, in the late 1500s. But her concern was King Philip of Spain. She decided to get back at him because he had fallen in love with, his, with her cousin from Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots. And Elizabeth uh, uh, lets Mary Queen of Scots come down to London on a vacation. And here she has the queen beheaded. And that makes Philip really mad because he's in love with Mary Queen of Scots. Well, at the same time, Elizabeth started putting pirates out in the Caribbean, out in the Bahamas, to rob the Spanish vessel. She called these men her privateers. And that was Walter Raleigh and John Hawkins and a lot of these other guys down here who's causing all the trouble, robbing the Spanish fleet. King Philip got tired of it. And he told the, he told the Pope, that this heretic British queen, this Protestant, is stealing their gold. And he decides to go after Elizabeth. And in 1588, he puts together a humongous armada, over 400 ships. They sail out of Spain and make their way to the, to the areas of Normandy, off the coast of France. King Philip has 30,000 soldiers and their plan is to attack England from the southern shore, come across the channel from Normandy and go clean across England and destroy the English empire. Do away with Elizabeth and all of her royal court. That's the game plan. Well, guys, things kind of happen in August of each year. That's hurricane season. And a hurricane developed just north of Bermuda off the North Carolina coast. A low pressure came off of Canada and push that hurricane right into King Philip's fleet off the coast of France, there at Normandy. Tore up his ships, tore up his navy. This is gonna to lead to the defeat of Spain by England here by 1600 in this great war between these two nations. 
As a matter of fact, that hurricane pushed those Spanish ships all up the coastline of the English Channel. Those boats wrecked over in the areas of Holland. They wrecked over in the areas of Scotland. Some of those boats went as far as Norway, where they crashed into the, into the uh, land. Several of those boats went to Ireland. And when these Spanish boys came into Ireland, they started marrying these young Irish girls. The Irish girls were blonde hair and blue eyed and very light complected. And when these Spaniards married into the Irish women here of this time period, their offsprings were redheaded and freckle faced. So it changed the it changed the DNA of the Scottish people when the Spaniards landed in Scotland and started intermingling, repopulating the people with their new DNA. So it's an interesting story here about the Irish here and how they changed complexions because of the war with Elizabeth here in 1588. Now we'll tell you in 1584, she did try to start a colony in North Carolina. Sir Walter Raleigh is going to go over and Sir Walter Raleigh is going to form a colony that is called Roanoke, the Roanoke Colony. And this colony is going to be a short-lived colony. They brought about 500 people over here. They put them on the outer banks of North Carolina. When they went back to check on these people about 10 years later in the early 1590s, they can't find them. The people have been lost. And so the Roanoke Colony is called the Lost Colony. We do not know what happened to these people. There's been a few hints along the way. In the 1615 time period, John Roth wrote about some blonde hair and blue eyed Indians coming to see him at Jamestown in the party of these Lenape Indians or in these Delaware Indians where some people with blonde hair and blue eyes. They could have intermingled with the Native Americans here. The only bet we have right now to find these people is going to be through DNA. And the University of North Carolina, University of Virginia, and so forth are doing scientific research using GN DNA, trying to find if they can find descendants of the lost people in today's genealogy. What a crazy way to find these folks. We're probably going to do it. Might be 10 or 12 years down the line, but we're going to find out where these folks, what happened to these folks, and, uh, and how they progressed. I got a feeling if they didn't join an Indian group during this time period, a hurricane got them. Could be either one. And North Carolina is well known for big, bad hurricanes. Okay? So the, 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 the jury is still out on having these people, but I think eventually we're going to find all these folks. Now, Elizabeth died in 1603. She had no heir to the throne. Okay? She was Protestant. So was her brother Edward. So was her father, King Henry. Remember, King Henry went through and changed religions because the, the Pope would not allow him to divorce Catherine of Aragon. And that's where, that's where he became Protestant. They did write a Bible in this time period. Miles Cloverdale wrote a New England Bible in the, in the 1530s, 1540 time period, but the Bible was not a really good translation. It had a lot of mistakes in it. It had a lot of falsities in it, a lot of false news, fake news in it, so forth. And so the English people wants a new Bible. Now, here's what's interesting. When Elizabeth died, there is nobody to take her place. Nobody. The only close heir to the throne of England is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. And they bring this young man, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, become the new king of England. So in the end, Mary, Queen of Scots got the last laugh. Elizabeth destroyed her, trying to keep her off the throne, but her son gains the throne. Now, I want you guys to realize something here. <clears throat> This boy, James, is going to be a devout Catholic. But England does not want Catholic rule. And so they make a deal with King James I. And he tells them, if you allow me to rule you as a Protestant, I will do so. I will still be Catholic in my heart, but I'm going to rule you as if I'm a Protestant king. And to show you my goodwill, 
I'm going to write a new Bible for the English people. This Bible was starting to be written around 1605. It's going to take about five years to write this new Bible. The Bible comes out around 1611. And the Bible is called the King James Bible. Okay? And, of course, we all still use it. You probably have one in your household, the old King James Bible. Now, here's what's important about this Bible. This Bible comes out as England is building colonies, okay? And your first four chapters of the Bible are the books of Moses. Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage to go to the promised land, to go to the holy land. When the British people begin to read Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, they start reading all these Bible, these, these chapters of the Bible, these books of the Bible, they're going to start seeing themselves as being the new children of God. Not the Israeli children, but the new children of God. A whole new group who's going to a promised land. The promised land is going to be North America. All things are possible if you can get to the colonies of North America. Okay? So they identify themselves as being God's chosen people to go to a new homeland to start over. Now, remember, a lot of these folks are trying to find religious freedoms. Your Quakers, your Puritans, those guys, Congregationalists. Those folks are trying to find the promised land. So they identify with Moses from the early chapters of the Bible. Okay? Now, one of your big things in all this are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in the six, early 1600s becomes part of British civil law. Thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, covet your neighbor, you know, be good to your moms and dads, all this kind of stuff. Those Ten Commandments becomes the, the bedrock of the British civil law. It becomes the bedrock of the American civil law. Okay? So those Ten Commandments are woven in here. But as they read these Bible chapters, these early chapters in the Bible, they're going to discover some, some various interesting things that they're going to apply. Remember, they believe the Bible is the gospel truth, and you must follow it to the letter. Okay? Go to Leviticus chapter 22 through chapter 25, and it's going to tell you several things. Number one, it's going to tell you that when you enter the promised land, as Moses did, there will be people with you who are poor. They have nothing. They need help. And in the scriptures, Moses tells these people that you shall enslave your brothers and your sisters for seven years to get them on their feet. Now, today, guys, that is called bankruptcy. Bankruptcy takes seven years to come out of bankruptcy. But during this time period, it's called indentured servitude. You are indentured for seven years by a family member that you are his servant to work his land, to work his fields. And once you end the seven years, you are given your freedom dues and allowed to progress on your own, to start over again with a whole new agenda. Okay? So, the children, the, children of, the children of England, the people who come to Jamestown, are going to use this system of indentured servitude to provide work that they need done on their fields until the mid-1600s. Do y'all know over 60,000 British people? This is men, women, and children. Semi-skilled, most of them are farmers, who come to, to the North America to build these colonies. 60,000 people came over indentured to work for seven years, get their freedom dues, get some property, and go from there. Okay? And we still do this today through bankruptcy laws. 
okay? The other area it talks about are the people who are living in the promised land once you arrive. Who are the people living in North America when the British arrive? It's the Native Americans. Moses was told by God, once you enter the promised land, you're going to find Hittites and Amorites and various people that you should not be dealing with. Your best option is to push these folks out of the way. Do not marry them. Do not build trade relations with these people. If you start intermingling with these people and you marry them, then you're going to cause your race of people to become splintered and you're going to lose a lot of your clout with God. What Moses was concerned with was what these people are going through, enjoying idols, worship, and all this, getting away from, from Christianity or from uh, the beliefs that Jewish people had during this time period. And so the British people tells their folks going to going to Jamestown, going to Virginia and other places, do not marry the Native Americans, do not have relations with them of any kind because they will bring you down. Actually, England passed laws in the 1690s that said that you cannot marry these people of North America. Okay? Whereas the Spanish and the French intermingle with the Native Americans and they marry the Native Americans and produce new children and new families here, okay? You're going to see that here, the British are totally different. They totally are going to snub the people around them and try to do away with them, okay? This is now called white supremacy. Okay, this is also part of the racism that comes out of the Jewish nations or the Jewish people being mistreated in the, in the 10, 12, 13 hundreds over in Europe. So this all comes as baggage with the folks who come to North America. Okay, so now there's rules for the poor. There's rules for those who are in the nations that you're going into to get rid of these folks. And then Moses says, there are people of color that are not like you in any way or any, or any cause, and you should enslave these people and enslave them from the cradle to the grave. England believes that these people are the people from Africa. So what happens here is, guys, they take the scriptures, they take the gospel, the writings of Moses, and they bastardize it. They make it into what they want it to be because they believe that they are God's chosen people. The British are the ones who have the real hangups here. Okay? So y'all remember all that stuff. That's very important to look at as we go into this discussion. The Bible comes out during the growth of Jamestown. The people who come to North America in the, in the 1619 period, the 1630s, the 1640s, the 1650s, brings this Bible with them. This becomes a part of the, of the British civil law and the British religious practices. I want you guys to remember this. This is where a lot of this stuff comes from. And God did not mean for this to happen. It's men who made this happen. Their own interpretation, their own greed their own white supremacy, if you will, they brought this to the table. And the British were the worst ones at doing this. Okay? Now, King James re realized in 1604 that they are way behind on building colonies. But King James also realizes that if the empire, the British empire, builds the colonies with royal money, they could go busted. And England could go under it because of bankruptcy. You'll see this happening to France when they start building Louisiana in the 1720 time period. They went bankrupt because the Mississippi Company goes bankrupt. And King James does not want this to happen. So he tells the British people, I want you guys to invest in these colonies going to North America. I want you to buy stock into these charter companies that are going to build these colonies. That way the loss will go across the board and not affect everybody. But then he says something else to them. 
I'm going to guarantee your money by giving you a royal charter. A royal charter says, if you should go bankrupt with these colonies, that I will pay you back your investment. Now, if you put a thousand, a thousand pence or a thousand pounds into this system, you'll get a thousand pounds back. You'll get a thousand pence back. You won't lose everything that you had. Okay. But here's the problem. If you're a charter company and you go bankrupt and King James has to go through and pay off your debt, who is going to lose their head? So it makes these charter come to become extra sensitive about making sure that they are successful, that they will not fall apart, they will not go bankrupt, okay? So you see what's going on here? King James is pretty shrewd with all this stuff. And of course, around 1606, here comes a little company called the London Company. And this company starts trying to find investors to build a colony in North America. They, in turn, will start what is called Virginia Company. And in 1607, they're going to send some hundred people across the Atlantic Ocean. They'll come into what's called the Chesapeake Bay region. And here, they're going to build on the James River, named for King James, a community that is named Jamestown. Okay, there are 64 wealthy men who come to North America in this group. They bring with them teenage boys, 14, 15, 16-year-olds. Why do they bring teenage boys with them to Virginia? Because these boys will do the dirty work. They're the ones who will do the work. I have learned something in my old age. I don't like cutting the grass in the yard anymore. I don't like putting out fertilizer and all that stuff. So I find me two or three teenage boys to come to my yard and let them do all my yard work for me. And I pay those kids $20 an hour. Any of you guys want to sign up? <laughs> That's pretty good wages. I just had two of them come up this weekend and I paid them both $75 for being there for about three, for about four hours. And they have, I gave them both $75. So the word comes out, if you want to get a good job, go see Mr. Weatherford and his yard and he'll, and he'll pay you for helping him. And that's how I got my, got get my workers now. I don't hire no lawn service. I know these teenagers, they want to go on dates and go on to movies and want to go out and have fun and do things. And this is a good way for them to do it. So, they brought these teenage boys because they will work. They will do what they need to be done. And of course, these men at Jamestown come into an area that is very swampy. That was not too smart of them to do so. If I'd have been them, I'd go to New Jersey, I'd go to Delaware, I'd go to New York, I'd go elsewhere besides to Jamestown. Because down here it's swampy, you've got dirty water, it's brackish, it's in a swamp. You have, to, you have to deal with all kinds of algaes and all kinds of poison in the area. Anthrax was around in the land here at this time period. You also have a problem with Native Americans. When you first arrive, they're curious about who you are and what you're up to. But once the diseases hit them, they start fighting back. They want to get rid of you. So those first few years at Jamestown are horrendous. You're going to have disease. You're going to have starvation, and you're going to have Indian attacks. And y'all write that down. You're going to see starvation, you're going to see disease, and you're going to see Indian attacks. By 1610, over 900 people have come to Virginia, and only 60 have survived. Going to Virginia in the early years is a death sentence. And of course, this really concerns the Virginia company because they realize if they should go bankrupt and King James has to pay back all these investors, that they're going to the Tower of London. And that's a trip you do not want to take. That's a one-way trip with a, with a bad ending happening for you. All right. So these guys started thinking, they considered what the French had done in Montreal and Quebec. 
when the French arrived up here in 1604 time period, they had all these men who came over and these men were pretty wild. They were drunk all the time. There's always fighting going on. A lot of these guys were fur trappers. They'd go out into the wilderness areas in November. They had passed out all these traps for the Indians to trap all these little animals when the spring thaw came out. They cheated the Indians. They bring in trade goods to get the furs, trade the trade goods for furs, and then get the Indians drunk and go off with everything, the trade goods and the furs. There's a lot of, a lot of greed, a lot of hatred, a lot of problems in, uh, in, in, in French Canada during this time period. How did King Louis solve the problem? King Louis brought in women and children. He brought in women and children. And by 1609, the French colonies began to stabilize. I want to tell you guys something. When society has problems, bring in the women. They're the ones who will solve the problems. Women do not put it with no foolishness. You know, the worst words in a man's vocabulary is, honey, we need to talk. When you hear those words, you're in trouble. And so the Virginia Company decided to bring women and children to Jamestown starting around 1611. By 1614, the colony begins to stabilize. A lot of folks said the hand of God had come across Virginia and prepared a place for them. No, it wasn't the hand of God, guys. It was diseases. Those Native Americans who lived around them are going to start feeling the, feeling the effects of smallpox and other European diseases. The hand of God did not give them the land. It was diseases that gave the land to the, to the people of England during this time period. Okay? In 1614, John Roth comes up from Havana, Cuba, and he brings with him some seed. Little bitty black seeds. And these seeds produce a plant called tobacco. I don't know how many of you guys have been to a tobacco plantation or to a tobacco farm, but I want to tell you, it is hard work trying to grow tobacco. And these people of, of Virginia are going to try to use a Native American labor as much as they can. But the labor runs out. By 1619, they have no laborers for this intensive crop called tobacco. You know, when you grow tobacco in February, you got to go through and build your hot houses. You go in there and you put in flower beds, you put a wall and a roof on it, you put a fireplace attached to it to keep it warm inside. You try to put windows on the outside so the sunlight will come in. And you plant these little bitty tobacco plants in these big, huge, long planters. When the plants get about five inches tall, you're ready to move it to the fields. Well, during the time this is growing, you're trying to get the, wheel, the, the fields ready for cultivation. You're out there trying to cut down oak trees and pine trees and pulling up roots and trying to plow and trying to get it all cultivated and rolled up into rows and the whole nine yards. And once that is done by the end part of April, this time of year, you're going to start seeing them bring out tobacco plants. Tobacco is planted off of a ground slide. A ground slide looks like a big sled. They're usually about six foot long and about four foot across. And you put several hundred plants on a ground slide. The mule pulls the ground slide out to the field. And the men on their hands and knees, or the ladies and the kids are on their hands and knees. And they plant the tobacco plants about, about a foot apart. Once the ground slide moves up the field, and they're planting on both sides of the ground slide. The next one that comes in, the next ground slide is full of water barrels. They got gourd dippers, and from these barrels, they dip the water onto the plant. It's like you going out there and planting flowers for Lowe's, and with the water hose, make sure it's all settled and set in and it's compacted. That's what's going on here also. And then, of course, right behind that, they fertilize, okay? Most time they use fish or use other manures of various kinds, horse manure, cow manure, whatever, chicken manure, to go through and, and feed these fields. 
okay? When tobacco gets about, oh, about three feet tall, here come the weeds. And all during May, in June and July and August, you go out there each day with a hoe and you hoe the weeds from around the, 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 around the tobacco. Those weeds will take nutrients away from the tobacco plants. The tobacco won't get very tall or get very sweet. It will not be a good taste in tobacco. So you want the weeds out of there as much as possible. So you go out there and you hoe out the weeds. That is called chopping the tobacco. Okay? Very laborious, intensive job. Okay? And by 1619, your laborers have all died of you. Well, guys, around 1600, 1610, 1615, a lot of your British landowners decided to stop farming and start raising sheep. The first big industry of England is going to be the wool industry. And by the early 1600s, they're heavily involved in trying to graze sheep. Now, if you're a farmer, you're on a, you're on a large farm, you might have 95, 100 people who work for you trying to grow crops. When you go from growing crops to raising sheep, how many people do you need? Maybe 10. So all of a sudden, 90 people get laid off from their jobs. It looks just like it does today with all these folks laid off because of this virus. These folks try to find work elsewhere. A lot of these folks are, are unskilled. They're good farmers, but they're unskilled laborers. And they go to Sheffield, they go to Plymouth, they go to Worcestershire, they go to, they go to London, they go to Bath. Stanford on the Avon, they go to all these places here, Bristol, they go to all these cities trying to find work, but there's no work for them. And you've got close to 25% of England that has no jobs, no place to go to. And a lot of these folks trying to find ways to get food. And a lot of folks start stealing. The prisons become full of people. Your debtor's prison becomes full of people. And the farmers of Jamestown are going to tell Parliament that they need workers. And Parliament goes to the Bible, and they read about being indentured. We will take all these poor people who have lost their jobs on the farms, the ones in prison, and these 21-year-olds and older will send to Virginia indentured. Will send us them to seven years of work in Virginia, growing these, growing this tobacco on these plantations. The landowners are told, if you go through and take these people and help pay their way over to Virginia, we will give you more land. You start building plantations instead of farms. Instead of having a hundred acres of land, you might get a thousand acres of land by the number of people you bring over who are indentured. As I mentioned a while ago, between, seven, between 1619 and 1660, they brought some 60,000 people from England indentured to Virginia as workers. That's pretty impressive, guys. They work seven years, and then the landowners would give them a little piece of property to farm on. Now, here's what's interesting about all of this. Tobacco kills the land. You smoke tobacco, it's going to eventually going to get you. It kills humans. It kills the land. Within three years of growing tobacco, that land is totally dead. You got to go in there and plant some wheat or plant some cotton or plant some soybeans, something else besides tobacco to bring that land back to where it can be harvested again. It can be farmed again. So what land did you get if you're indentured? You got that old burned up tobacco land that nobody wanted. So you had a tough go for the first three or four years being freed. You go through and build you a little log house, a little old room, one room log house, and you get married. 
And all of a sudden, you got five or six children. The average family during this time period had between four and 16 kids. Well, I should say most had most around 10 kids, 12 kids for a family. You start having babies with young ladies when y'all were about 15 years old, and you don't get through until menopause hits. So you got about 25 or 30 years of having babies uh, in your lifetime. That's a pretty rough way to go in my book, okay? But that's how you got started. The more kids you have, the more workers you had on your little farm. So you go to get some chickens, a milk cow or two, a horse or two, and you try to get this land started and work your way up as quickly as possible. And in 1619, here comes the indentured 21-year-old, semi-skilled, unskilled farmers who had lost their jobs because of the sheep industry, because of the wool industry. Okay? Then they started thinking, you know, London and Sheffield and Bristol and Plymouth and all these, these are full of children, vagrant children. They're eight little eight, nine, ten year olds that have no family members. And why can't they too go to Virginia? So they started rounding up children. Orphanages were opened up, and all these kids, both on the streets and in orphanages, were sent to Virginia. If you was eight years old going to Virginia, you were indentured until you turned 21 years of age. So child labor begins in Virginia in 1619. And you have thousands of children who go to Virginia because they had no other place to go to. The fate of the children here in America. This is where child labor started in 1619. It does not end until 1938. My generation, all this guy, all this baby boomers born after 1945 up to 1960, all of us baby boomers are the first generation of children in America who did not work as children. My father told me when he turned eight years old, he was introduced to the back end of a mule and he started plowing. He plowed until he started college when he turned 19. Then World War II broke out, and they all go to Europe. My dad told me that going to Europe in World War II was kind of like spring break. You're not plowing, and you were fighting once in a while, but it was not that bad until D-Day. Then it all broke loose after D-Day. But he said they thought that World War II was spring break those first couple of years because they were sitting around England and drinking beer and trying to put together airplanes and tanks and all this stuff, trying to get ready for that D-Day invasion at Normandy. So it's interesting how you perceive all this history and this, how these stories kind of tie together uh, when you start looking at all these different events and different facts here, okay? In 1619, a Dutch ship comes into Jamestown. Now, we're not sure if the Dutch ship had come in to, to trade goods or if it had come in just to cause havoc or whatever. But on board this ship were 24 people from Angola, African people. And these Dutchmen are going to go and sell these people to the people of Jamestown. Okay? They're going to send them, they're going to, to sell these people to the people of Jamestown. This is where African slavery began in American history. Between 1619 and 1808, the United States outlawed the African slave trade. In other words, you cannot bring slaves from Africa after 1808. Between 1619 and 1808, 640,000 souls are stolen from Africa and brought directly to the United States. 640,000 people are going to come to the United States. Now, in all, at all total, between the French and the Portuguese and the Dutch and all these folks, over 20 million people were stolen from Africa. Africa has never regained the population that was stolen through the African slave trade. Okay. 
these folks are going to be looked at through the eyes of Moses. At first, they said, we'll buy these folks and free them after seven years, like we do the indentured people. And then somebody says, no, Moses tells you here that you'd have these people from, from the cradle to the grave. Out in the Atlantic Ocean, in, at, out on the edge of the Caribbean, out in the Atlantic Ocean area, is an island called Barbados. It is 25 square miles. Barbados becomes the largest sugarcane island in the British Empire. The island is 95% slave. And out here in Barbados, they begin to write slave codes, slave laws. And by 1660, these slave laws are going to go to Virginia. And all of a sudden, slavery is going to be from the cradle to the grave. Okay, and they are going to try to increase the number of slaves by having them repopulated. Okay, letting them go through and have natural increase through population processes. Okay, so guys, slavery begins in Virginia in 1619. Also in 1619, they start what is called the House of Burgesses to bring self law into the colony. With the House of Burgesses, they're going to start a sheriff's department. There'll be a sheriff and his deputies trying to maintain law and order. They're going to build a courthouse in these little communities in Virginia. They're going to have lawyers and courts in these courthouses. There's going to be land records and land deeds kept in these courthouses. They're going to tell the men folks that you must serve the county at least two, year, two weeks out of the year. Every two weeks, you must serve your county, either digging water wells, and yes, I told you, digging water wells. How many of you guys can dig an 85-foot deep water well with a shovel? And you're going down in that thing with a rope to the very bottom, and they're using a pail to get the, to get the dirt out of the bottom, and you're down there 25 or 30 feet deep, keeping on digging, trying to get to 85 feet deep. I couldn't do it. I'd go crazy in that hole. There's just no way. That's how you, that's how you make your water wells during this time period. All right, when, the, when it rained and you, and you started getting water in that water well, you let it settle for a few days so it's not muddy, so you can start drinking it. You guys would not drink that water to save your souls. You're doing good drink bottled water. If y'all drunk tap water, you'd be in trouble. All right, y'all like that designer water bottles you have out there. And here these guys are drinking muddy water out of a water well. Okay. You also had to go through and build roads. Road construction was a major project during this two weeks that you have to serve your county. If you didn't build roads, you're sent to the docks to help build the docks here along your harbors to build these, to build these uh, uh, walkways and, and, uh, and uh, different kinds of, uh, of, 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 of areas to, to, to put your cargo on and so forth, your decks and so forth. So you're going to be busy doing that. You know, I found old John Weatherford. He came to Virginia in 1634. He came in indentured. He's a poor guy. He didn't have nothing going on. He was part of the militia for a time. He finally gained some property. And when he was called to serve on that two-week notice, he cooked. I love to cook. I think old John taught me how to cook. And he was always known as being a good cook here, making those ribs and those chicken and dumplings and all that good food here for these folks out here in this time working. But he was a cook for two weeks on the job. Yeah, you too can find what your family's up to. In history, if you do a little bit of research and start digging through all the records, you too can find all this stuff. Okay, you know, John got married late in life. He was like in his early 50s. He had one son named William. And old William had four sons. And all, all four of those boys came to Georgia. And that's where I came out of. That was that bunch of Georgia boys. And uh, it's interesting to look at all that early history of these people and what all they did uh, in the 1700s and, and what kind of jobs they had. They were in retail. They were retail folks. I worked retail for about 15 years in the limited stores. So I know where they're coming from, being, being merchants here in this time period. Okay? So, guys. 
indentured servants and slaves were seen in the same eyes here. The landowners also had to serve two weeks on duty. If you're over 18 years of age and you're, uh, you're the son of a plantation owner, you too had to serve two weeks on the road building or the building the courthouses or building the water wells or whatever. It's just part of the deal here, guys. Okay, so you knew that two weeks out of the year you had to do work for the county. Could you guys see y'all doing that nowadays? Spending two weeks out of the year working on the county roads, digging ditches and working on the on the East Pass and all this kind of stuff. You know, it might come back around again one day. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? The new normal might be a whole different ball game than what it was about 10, 10 or 12 weeks ago. 15 weeks ago, okay? And then the next thing in 1619 is here come the Presbyterians. Here comes your first major church to Virginia, the Presbyterians. They believed in the Calvinistic ideology or theology of being predestined. A lot of Southerners did not go to church because they were predestined. He said, if God's already chosen, if I'll go to heaven or hell, I ain't going to worry about it. I won't go to church on Sundays. I'll just do what I want to on Sundays. I'll go, I'll go fishing or I'll go hunting or whatever I want to do. I just won't worry about going to church. Okay? This will all change once the Great Awakening comes in the 1730s. And, of course, Virginia becomes very religious during this time period. Okay? Now, in Virginia, they do not build schools. The people of Virginia believe that education is learning a trade, that you learn how to grow tobacco, you learn how to blacksmith, you learn how to go through and cure leather and make leather goods. Those are called tanners. You are also become coopers. Coopers made wooden boxes and wooden barrels to store stuff, to ship items in. Your tobacco was shipped in big old huge wooden barrels during this time period. So wood was very important for your shipping materials to put your, your produce in to go to England to be turned into tobacco, chewing tobacco and turned into cigars and so forth, okay? So that's part of the deal here. A lot of the men learn how to become not only blacksmith and coopers and tanners, but also sawyers. They saw the planks. They saw the, the logs into planks. I want to ask you guys a question. How did you go through and cut planks in the 1600s? You don't have no saw mills. There's no, there's no steam power to turn a saw, a saw blade to cut a plank. What they did was they dug a hole that was six foot deep, usually about eight foot long and about 10 foot wide. They'd bring those logs in there and those men would hoist those logs onto, onto saw horses. And using cross saws, they began to cut the log until the log could be placed over the hole where the saw could clear the hole. And then they saw that log down the middle with a man on top and a man on the bottom sawing that log. You got to the other side, you put that log back on, back on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the saw horses and you finished off the plank. And then you put it all up again and you started the next log, the next plank. And you made them usually about two inches wide. You have to be real careful sawing these logs because the saw would get stuck. You'd get in there sideways and you get a stuck saw and you'd have major problems. If you're also trying to saw through pine, you got all that old rosin trying to saw through, not old, and all that sticky stuff is inside of pine trees. So making logs was not easy, or making planks, I should say, was not easy. The best way to build a house was just make a log house. We're about planks later on. You start seeing plank houses around the 1820 time period, and you start seeing portable sawmills, steam-powered sawmills that can make the logs a lot faster. That's where across the South you start seeing all these plank houses being built. Okay? So they use the logs to build their houses with during this time period. So sawyers were very important people. You know, I was reading some articles about these people who made who had these, these early saw holes 
when the, when the holes got thought full of sawdust, they put a hut over them. And on these, and in these huts, they turned the sawdust into a place to put ice. Near the middle of December and January, February, and you can't use the land for anything, so the land's all frozen up. The slaves would go off to the lakes and the ponds and cut blocks of ice. Bring them from the lake down on down to the ice to the ice pit, using those old uh, those old uh, ground slides, and they'd unload the ice blocks and put them in that sawdust, and that ice stayed frozen usually until the first part of uh, the first part of August. You'd have ice for your sweet tea and your lemonade all day in April, May, June, July. By the first of August, you started running out of ice. That's pretty impressive how you built these ice houses this this away, and using that, that old sawdust to store the ice blocks in, with with the shed over the top of them to keep the sun from melting the ice too quickly. So they learn how to do all this stuff here. So they're like digging water wells and they're making ice houses and everything here in these early years here in Virginia. They're pretty industrious people here, but they did not have education. They believe that people should learn a trade. Okay. And by the way, this is true also for the young ladies. The women folks were involved in making soap. They used hog lard, the hog fat. They used the ashes from your fireplaces. They ran water through the ash. That made what is called lye. They made lye soap. It's used to bathe with. It's used to scrub your floors with. They used lye soap to wash clothes with. The women made soap. They made candles. They made perfumes. They cooked, they, they, had, they had bakeries, they had all kinds of candies and cookies and cakes they'd make and so forth. So these people who come to Jamestown are not only farming, they also are people who are yeoman farmers that are involved in industry. They have homespun industry, okay? They are self-made in, uh, industrialists here in this time period. Okay, so these folks are getting busy here making all kinds of products on the side besides just growing tobacco. They had a multi-income family going on here. You know, my grandparents had this going on in the 1930s. They had a tree farm. They grew cotton. They grew tobacco. They grew watermelons. They grew other cash crops, including soybeans. My grandpa Calsey had a dairy farm. He had a tree farm. And they diversified how they made a living. Same thing here, guys. You're a cooper, you're, you're a carpenter, you're a blacksmith. You make money on the side while you're growing crops. Your wife might be involved in making soap, or she might be a seamstress who makes clothing during this time period, or a weaver who makes cloth. And so you start seeing these families who are pretty industrious during this time period. You know, I pulled the, the 1850 federal census and looked at my family in Mississippi during this time period. Richard and Lucinda, they made $800 a year. She's a seamstress. He's a cotton farmer. He's also a school teacher, and he's also a Baptist preacher. And they made $800 in 1850. That equates to $80,000 today. So you get an idea how, that your family has always been pretty prosperous. If they were farmers or, or, or uh, industrialists of some kind, own little industrial uh, complexes and so forth. They did quite well for themselves. The same thing in Jamestown. And these folks started making money. Jamestown and Virginia becomes the star in the British Empire. Virginia is the place that makes England lots and lots of money. And their El Dorado is going to be tobacco. They're going to grow lots and lots of tobacco. Okay? They don't have a lot of churches. They don't have a lot of schools. Their main thing is agriculture. They're an agrarian society growing these crops. Well, the next little colony that comes up is going to come up around 1628. The little colony is called Maryland. There's a group of, of Catholics in England that helped old King Charles II gain the throne of England once King James died. King James died in 1625. When King Charles becomes king, 
He wants to bring back the Catholic Church to England. He's not going to be a good Protestant king as King James had been. And, of course, this is going to cause lots of problems, major problems in England because of King Charles. Well, one of the families who helped King Charles regain the throne were the family who was part of the Baltimore clan. And Lord Baltimore and his group are going to come to Maryland and build a new colony just for Catholics. It's for Catholics who feel persecuted in England. Okay? So religion does play a role in Maryland. But they also bring in indentured servants. And they also grow, start growing tobacco. They do have schools. They're Catholic schools. If you're a middle class and you afford to send your kid to a Catholic school, you would do so. So Maryland is a little bit different than it, what it was in Virginia when it comes to religion and to education. Okay? But the vast majority of people in Maryland were poor Catholics who were indentured trying to make a living. Okay? So your first two big for, for southern colonies here in North America will be Maryland and will be Virginia. These two colonies are going to take off. They become the El Dorado of the British Empire. They're the place that Britain, that the English people realize is going to give them the powerhouse. Okay? So they start building this colony here, and this colony starts really growing. Okay? Now, with King Charles taking the throne of England, King Charles I taking the throne of England in 1625, King Charles brings back the Catholic Church. He also brings the Civil War to England. In 1649, the Puritans are going to capture King Charles I, and they're going to behead him. And when this happens, his family is going to flee to France. So Charles II, James II, the wife, all the kids are going to go to France to keep from being murdered, genocide, by the Puritans. And in 1649, they put in a dictator, a lord protector, if you will, to oversee England. His name is Oliver Cromwell. Oh, was he bad news for the British people. He's going to shut down the House of Commons in Parliament. He'll only have the House of Lords. He's going to appeal to only the wealthy folks and not to the poor folks. It's going to be a major problem. Okay? We enter a time period starting in 1629 that is called the British Civil War. It's going to last until Oliver Cromwell dies in 1659. He only rules about 10 years, guys, and then he dies. And when he dies, the people of England are going to start calling for the king to come back. And they go to France, they find Charles II, and he becomes your new king. So King Charles II, he starts to rule around 1660. He'll rule until around 1685. Okay? He is called the Restoration King. And this king is going to be heavily involved in building new colonies. Okay? But there's one little side note you guys to realize. The London Company is going to sponsor a new colony in the year 1630. You're in the year of turmoil. You're going to see a new colony being built. And this colony is called Massachusetts. Okay, this colony is going to actually be started a little bit early in the 1620s when the pilgrims come across during this time period. And of course, William Bradford is your big leader here of these Puritans. And William Bradford and his guys wrote what is called the Mayflower Compact. These Puritans are seeking religious freedom here in this time period. They're the ones who are credited with America's first Thanksgiving not considering St. Augustine has been here for a long time, and they actually had the first one, but they're the ones who really brought the Thanksgiving to the table. And, of course, they're going to be a royal charter here in this time period. They are a, period, they are a pilgrim group seeking religious freedom. 
Well, right behind them, a few years later, comes Massachusetts, and here comes their leader, Mr. John Winthrop. Mr. Winthrop brings in the Puritans into this group, and these folks up here in New England, Massachusetts region, are trying to seek religious freedom. They're tired of state and state and religion being together. And one of the guys who's totally against state and state and church being together was Roger Williams. As a matter of fact, Roger Williams left Massachusetts and around 1635 started his own colony called Rhode Island. And this colony is strictly for religious freedom. Rhode Island is designed to allow people to have their own churches, to vote in their own churches, to have total freedom of religion. And Rhode Island becomes a melting pot. You see Catholics and Jews and a lot of different groups come to Rhode Island during this time period. Roger Williams also starts a Protestant denomination. He starts what is called the Baptist Church. So here come the Baptists here in Rhode Island during this time period. Now, back in Massachusetts during the 1630 time period, they're going to do a lot of things. Number one, they build the town of Salem. They outgrow it pretty quickly. And the next big town is going to be Boston. Within 10 years, there are 75 villages, suburbs, if you will, that are surrounding Boston you got some 60,000 people who have moved here from England. A lot of these guys were Puritans who were tired of being controlled by the state, by the king, by the parliament. They come to America for religious freedom. Okay? These folks up here are not big-time farmers. It's too cold up here to grow a lot of crops. The soil is also rocky. So these folks are going to build their small yeoman farms and industrialize in their farms. Yeah, they're going to be carpenters, and they're going to be blacksmiths and coopers. They're going to build wagons and make wagon wheels and make all kinds of chairs and furniture. The wives will get involved in soap making and candle making and being seamstress and making all kinds of fabric, mainly out of wool. You're going to start to see a whole new industry begin up here. The American South, Virginia, Virginia and Maryland, are going to be agrarian. They're going to be farmers. But in New England, they're going to be industrialists. You're already seeing a split between North and South. They also want their children to be able to read their Bibles. You know, in 1639, the first printing press comes to Boston. They started printing Bibles. The first printing press in the New World is going to be in Boston. And they start writing religious pamphlets. They start writing sermons. They write Bibles. They print Bibles and so forth here in Boston with the printing press. They're going to start a new college up here in 1636 to teach ministers how to preach. The new college is called Harvard. I want one of you guys to apply to go to Harvard. I'm looking forward to writing a letter to Harvard to get you in there. I've had several kids get into schools at Duke and Rice, and uh, uh, I had one that got in at Georgetown and other places. I want to see one of you guys go up here to Harvard. I'm not going to pay for it, but I want to see you guys apply for a job, for a, a, a going to college at Harvard. I'll write you a good letter if you go to Harvard. I just wrote a letter for one of my students who's going to go to medical school, I'm trying to get him set up to go to medical school for the next four years. So I'll help you guys out on these letters. I write a letter to Florida State. I write one to Alabama. You know, I write one to Ole Miss and Southern Mississippi. I write y'all letters. So if y'all need a letter from me, y'all let me know, and I'll, send, and I'll write you one. I've done for several students here, University of Florida, Sanford, of, of, uh, Florida Southern. I've done a lot of letter writing. So if you guys need letters, y'all let me know. Okay? So, guys, they're going to build the first university, the first college in Massachusetts, the first one in the new world. Okay, these folks want their kids to read and write. So they have homeschooling. They use the Bible as their textbook to teach the kids how to read. I guarantee you, if you asked your grandpa, if you got a great grandpa who's in his 90s, I guarantee you he learned how to read through the Bible 
that his mom and dad or his grandpa sat him down and taught him how to read out the Bible. That's how my dad learned how to read. Grandpa Will sat him down and taught daddy how to read out of the Bible. He was four, he was four years old and could read because grandpa got the Bible out for him to read out of. So y'all look into all that good stuff here about education here. All right. In 17, I'm sorry, in 1640, they passed the rule of Massachusetts that any village with more than 50 families would have a free public school. Any village with more than 75 families would have a free public school system. So the people of New England are readers. They are writers. They keep documents here. The American South, the literacy rate was less than 20%. Up in New England, it was 85%. Boys and girls could read in New England, the most literate part of the world here. So they're more industrial minded in New England, okay? They also realize that education makes for better citizens. If you're educated, you can make your own decisions about how you should vote. You don't let your, your friends tell you how to vote, you decide on your own how you will vote during this time period. Okay, so Scott, guys, you see a different place building up here in this time period. When it, I'm sorry, when it comes to industry, you're gonna see shipbuilding, you're gonna see fishing, you're gonna see merchant fleets and merchant housing. I should say merchant houses that brings the goods into, into and out of the ports. You're gonna see banks and insurance companies and you will find financial institutions. Here's what's important. These banks, these merchants, the merchant fleets, these shipbuilders are going to come to the American South. The people of New England supports this transportation of supplies from the American South to the mother country of England. The South depends on the New England for the transport of goods to and from England, okay? Massachusetts and Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, all these little colonies that are formed up here by 1640, by 1650, these little colonies are heavily involved in the African slave trade. They do bring slaves into the South. They'll take goods to England, transport goods to Africa, and then bring slaves across back over to North America. That's called the triangular root system. They're heavily involved in it. So the people of New England gets extremely wealthy from working with the South. The South gets wealthy because New England carries their goods to the European marketplaces starting in London. Okay? Then England realizes something. By the 1650s, not only is the American people producing the goods for England, they're also the best consumers of England. So we're buying the goods back from England. North America is a great El Dorado for England. Okay? So they're not stealing from Spain, but they are sure worried about Spain stealing from England. That's why they go through and build the Red Coat Navy, I mean, the Red Coat Army, and they build the Royal Navy during this time period to make sure that their produce, that their goods on the high seas not being stolen by Spain or from the Dutch or by the French because England realizes that turnabout could be fair play. And so they build the greatest Navy, they build the greatest Army to make sure the trade routes, the trade uh, links stay connected, okay? So they're concerned about other countries stealing from them during this time period. So you see what's going on here, guys? The Southern colonies, they're agrarian, they're growing crops. They're not concerned about church nor education. But in New England, they cannot grow crops, but they're industrialists. They're big shippers. They have big merchant houses up here. They make money off of trade, okay? They're totally different in this time period. And by the 1700s, they have nicknames for each other. The Southerners are calling them Yankees. The Northerners are calling them Rednecks. You start seeing this, this 
yin yang going on between the two regions that Washington told us that the North and the South must stay equal in trade alliances. We must stay equal because the North supports the South, the South supports the North. If a war should ever come and divide these two regions, America could be in trouble. Washington warned us a civil war, guys. And he knew it was going to come between the North and the South because it started way back here in this time period. Okay? Now, the other colony that were formed behind Massachusetts is going to be Rhode Island. What Roger Williams is going to have this colony formed in 1636. He breaks away from Massachusetts because Mr. Winthrop said a, a, a citizen had to be a church member. Williams didn't like this. He said a, said a citizen is a person over the age of 21. A white male over the age of 21 who owns property is a citizen. Winthrop said you had to be married, you had some children, you had to own property and be a church member in order to be a citizen. And Mr. Williams says, no way, this will not happen. All right, then you have Mr. Thomas Hooker. Mr. Hooker is going to form Connecticut in 1635 because he too is upset about how John Winthrop wants to rule Massachusetts. And another break off is going to be John Wilwright. Mr. Wilwright will form New Hampshire also in the mid 1630s. So now New England is made up of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Those are your four New England colonies of this time period. Your southern colonies are Maryland and Virginia. Okay. Well, guys, once the war has ended and things kind of get settled in England, King Charles II wants to build new colonies. And he realizes he's got a major threat from the South. Down in Florida are the Spanish. And he's worried that the Spanish might attack Virginia. Break up our colony, take our colony in Virginia away from England. So he decides to build a buffer colony between Spanish Florida and Virginia. The year is 1664. The new colony is called North Carolina. And they start out towards Goldsboro and out toward Raleigh, back on out toward Alamar Sound, out to New, uh, new Bern, out in that area, down toward Wimbledon, out toward the Outer Banks, and they start building the new colony out here on the eastern part of North Carolina. The people who come down here to farm this region will be mostly your indentured servants because they need land. So this allows us to send the indentured servants down to North Carolina to settle this land and be a buffer zone for Virginia. Does England really care about the welfare of these people in North Carolina? No, not really. They were the poor they got rid of. They were the trash they got rid of, they called them during this time period, the little people they called them this time period. And they make a good buffer between Spanish Florida and Virginia. Well, guys, 10 years later, here come the men from Barbados, that island out there on the, on the, uh, west, on the eastern side of the Atlantic way down there off the coast of, of northern Brazil, way down there. And these men realize their sons have no place to go to for an inheritance. And so the, the men of Barbados goes to Parliament to petition a colony just for Barbados. And King Charles says, you know, North Carolina is doing pretty well. They're growing lots of tobacco in this region. They're adding to the royal coffers, the royal money supply. So let's go for and let these people of Barbados have a colony in North America. And they chose what is called the Low Country. In the Low Country, they build a community. They build a city named for King Charles II. The city is named Charlestown. By 1800, it's called Charleston. And here they come in here to build this new colony here 
in what is now called South Carolina. So you guys remember indentured servants built North Carolina. Barbadians are the ones who built South Carolina. When the people of Barbados come in here, they bring with them their sugar cane. And this low country being wet is a good place to grow sugar cane. In wet climates, another good crop to grow is rice. So the people of South Carolina not only grow tobacco and hemp, as they did in Virginia and North Carolina, they're going to start growing rice. They're going to start growing sugar cane. And South Carolina becomes the greatest El Dorado in the British Empire. South Carolina brings in more money than any other place. So the restoration colonies of the South are going to be North Carolina and South Carolina. Okay? Now, by this time, we realize that the Dutch are right in the middle of the British colonial America. And the Dutch are not wanted here. The Dutch control an area that is called New Amsterdam and a place that is called New Jersey. And the British come in here in 1664. In the early summer of 1664, a big battleship sails into Hudson Bay. They point their guns, their big cannons, toward the little town of New Amsterdam. And they tell the people here, either surrender or your town would be blown apart. Now, Peter Syverson was in charge of this town. The, the Dutch West India Company had brought him as a manager in the 1640s to stabilize this colony, and he did so. And Peter Syverson does not want to give this colony to Great Britain. But the people of the town signed a petition of surrender. And the first name on that list was his son. Without firing a shot, England took over the Dutch colony here of New Amsterdam. King Charles will name the colony after his brother, the Duke of York. And here comes the new colony of New York. Now to the Dutch, this is a third rate colony. You want to get rich in your Dutch, you go to the Spice Islands. You got to Indonesia, out to Malaysia, out to Singapore, out here in that part of the world is where they got wealthy. They got wealthy in Brazil with the African slave trade. But here, the British take over and turn New York into a major mercantile center. They run slaves in from Africa into New York. They run the slaves out to the colonies here in the South. Okay, <clears throat> they start shipbuilding. They start building rope here and sails. And they found that the, that the supply and the shipping industry is a major, major profit maker. I mean, you guys look at the airline business today. You'll go to Tulsa, American Airlines does all the overhaul work, or go to Atlanta where Delta does all the overhaul work. And they go through and rebuild jet engines, they rebuild wings, they rebuild fuselages, they, re, they redo the interiors of airplanes, all this stuff. They do it for other companies around the world. You'll see all kinds of airline airliners parked in Atlanta from countries from around the world that Delta's rebuilding their airplanes. That's what New York City's doing here. They become one of the major industrial centers in the colonies. And of course, they bring in banking and finance and insurance companies. <clears throat> and trade houses and all this good stuff. So where the Dutch had a little third-rate enterprise going on, the British builds a major mercantile center out of New York, okay? And then they look across the harbor or across the, across the river at New Jersey. New Jersey is called the Garden State because New Jersey grows lots of crops. New Jersey is a good place to grow through, go and grow wheat and corn and all kinds of vegetables and raise animals. Uh, the dairy industry became big. The, the making of cheese became big in New Jersey. New Jersey becomes a, becomes a colony that feeds New York. It's going to feed Philadelphia. It's going to feed, feed Pennsylvania. So a major agrarian colony 
that's going to be formed right behind New York is going to be New Jersey for producing the food that they need here for these larger cities around them. Down below New Jersey is Delaware. Delaware was controlled by the Swedes. The British ran them out also. So here comes Delaware as a new colony during this time period, also involved in agrarian production, growing crops, okay, growing food stuff. All right. Well, when King Charles II regained the throne of England, he had a gentleman who helped him gain that office. The, fan, the man's name was Penn, P-E-N-N. And Mr. Penn was too old to receive his reward that King Charles wanted to give him. King Charles II wanted to give him a colony. And Mr. Penn says, well, my son, who's about 34 years old, is the age that could do well with a colony. So here comes William Penn across around 1682 to build a new colony called Pennsylvania. Mr. Penn is a Quaker. He believes in religious freedom. He believes in civil liberties. He believes in separation of church and state. And Mr. Penn is going to build a city named Philadelphia that he calls the city of brotherly love. You know, when William Penn came in and built Philadelphia, he wanted to see a lot of greenways. He wanted to see a lot of parks and a lot of fields and lots of nice houses and so forth. So he built the town with wide boulevards and lots of parks, lots of green areas and so forth. He builds a true Renaissance city, the city of Philadelphia. Okay. And this, it becomes a melting pot. People from all over Europe are going to come to Pennsylvania for religious freedom. They come to New York for religious freedom. Okay. Do y'all know we had close to 35 different languages being spoken in New York alone in the 1660s and 1670s? There's a lot of languages being spoken in one area. The same thing for, for Philadelphia. These are big areas here. The only thing about Philadelphia is their port. The port of Philadelphia is bigger than the harbor in New York is. It's got a deeper, it's got a deeper entry into their port. The, the, the largest port in the British Empire, of course, was London. Number two is Philadelphia. Number three was New York. But then you had Baltimore. You had Annapolis. You'll have Charleston. You'll have Wilmington, North Carolina. You'll also have Boston Harbor during this time period. So England has lots of good places here for trade coming in and out of North America. Okay. Now the people of Philadelphia will be artisans. They'll also, you know, have small industries just like New York and Boston has. But there's one major difference. In Pennsylvania, they can grow crops. They do grow corn, they do grow wheat, they grow a little bit of tobacco up there. So Philadelphia, Pennsylvania becomes a, a big area because they can diversify their crops like they can in South Carolina, okay? So all this is going on here in these colonies, they're all different. So here are your early colonies, you wanna write them down. Let's start with New England. The first colony in New England is gonna be Massachusetts. Then it's going to be Rhode Island. Then it's going to be New Hampshire. And then it's going to be Connecticut. That's your New England colonies. Your mid-Atlantic colonies will be New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. Your southern colonies will be Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. There'll be no new British colony until 1730 when Georgia shows up. And we'll discuss Georgia here in a little bit, what's going on with Georgia, okay? I want you guys to realize this, that 64% of the wealth from North America is going to England 
from the American South. They produce 64% of the British mercantile system. And I want to spend just a few minutes with you discussing mercantilism and what mercantilism actually is. Mercantilism is how England built their economy. The economy is based off of mercantilism. Mercantilism will evolve into capitalism by the 1820s. And here is what you need to have a mercantile economy. The most important thing is you must have a standard monetary system. That your money is the same across the entire empire. If you live in India, if you live in, in uh, uh, Philippines, if you live in South Africa, if you live in Great Britain or in the British colonies, you have the same money supply. It is all worth the same. It keeps folks from being cheated in mercantilism. And of course, you're going to have a monetary system that is based on the pound, the pence, and the shilling. If you look at the early inventory records of Virginia from the 1700s, 1740 time period, 1730 time period, it is all done in pounds and shillings and pences. All these inventories on all these plantations in the American South were all done based on European, on British money. So you have to have the same monetary system, okay? Number two, you must have a way, you must have a way to control your labor. You must have work rules, work standards, and you must find the cheapest labor that you can find to make the most profits. They started off by using Indian folks in Virginia as servants. They died off. They brought in the indenture, the poor from England. They ran out of them by 1660. And in 1660, they bring in the African slaves. Slavery becomes the cheapest labor in the mercantile system. And England is going to exploit it. You know, they started a company in England in 1660 under King Charles II called the Royal African Company. They went down to Portugal and got leases and purchased a lot of those old, those old mercantile forts they built in the 1440s along the west coast of Africa. England went through and flipped them into slave forts. They built big holding pens to hold people. They brought in merchants here. They went across Europe and, and got people involved in shipping to go down to Africa with their ships to bring slaves out of Africa to the New World, to, to North America mainly. They ran those slaves, those slave forts like a Walmart store. They supplied them. They had managers, they had under managers, assistant managers. They had bookkeepers and accountants and all of these folks in the slave force that closed across the coast of West Africa. England told the poor boys of Europe, if your daddy has no land for you to go to, come join the Royal African Company and become wealthy from the African slave trade. And when it kind of teeters out and goes away, you can go to the Americas and get land to live on. There'll be a place for you in the British Empire. And you had thousands of young men who were poor go to London and join the Royal African Company and go to Africa and work out of these slave forts. And this Royal African Company was highly organized. In all of your port cities, they're going to have agents. Just like you got State Farm and GEICO and all these insurance companies around America, Liberty Life and all these guys, you had slave offices in all your major port cities. Let's say you live in Charleston, South Carolina during this time period. You got a, you got a plantation you just got started. You got 25 slaves, but you need about 25 more. So you go down to Charleston to the Royal African Company's office and you talk to the agent. 
and you tell him that you want 15 young boys that are strong and healthy around the age of 20, and you want about 14 young girls, 15 young girls that are of childbearing age, and you want them healthy. You're out here ordering almost 30 people here from this Royal Effing Company guy. He wants a down payment. Write a check to him. Are you giving some money for, for a down payment? And this kind of order would cost you close to $15,000 in their money. You're talking about close to a hundred, almost a million dollars today, almost a million dollars today for this order. The order is filled out in Charleston. All the details are given and you give the man your branding iron. That's how you mark your property with your branding iron. And this order and the branding iron goes to the, goes to London to the Royal Electric Company where it's processed. Their agents there will go through and get right the details and so forth. And they'll send the order on down to Africa, to the big, huge slave fort. Well, you know what's interesting about all this stuff? In London, they have formed an insurance company that insures these slaves in transit going across the Atlantic Ocean. This insurance company is called Lloyd's of London. They're still in business today. They're one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Lloyd's of London insure your airliners for your airline companies. Lloyd's of London insures your sports stars and your musicians. Lady Gaga, Britney Spears, Justin Beaver, all your great athletes are insured by Lloyd's of London. If they lose their vocal cords and cannot sing, and they're guaranteed to make $100 million over their lifetime, the money is guaranteed through Lloyd's of London. If you get a big, huge contract to play, to play, to play pray, pro football, and you get hurt within your third year, and you can't play anymore, Lloyd's of London fulfills your contract. They're still paying for humans, guys. So these slaves being brought out of Africa are insured by Lloyd's of London. If anybody dies on the way to North America, the insurance companies pays for their losses. Okay? That order comes in from London to that slave fort. And the old manager of the slave fort says, I got an order here from Charleston for 30 slaves, 15 young girls, 15 young boys. We don't have a lot of inventory right now because the ship left here about two weeks ago carrying people to Barbados. So let's go out into the forest and find some people to bring in here. They go 10, 15, 20, sometimes 100 miles into the savannas, into the jungles looking for people. The people of Africa were agrarian people. They had a montrelineal system like the Native Americans had. The women farmed the land, the men prepared the land. They lived in villages. The villages were usually made out of straw, made out of green materials, and there's a wall around the cities, around their villages. They had four gates, a north gate, a south gate, an east gate, and a west gate. And they would leave in the morning, the workers would, got to the fields to grow their crops. They grew wheat, they grew barley, they grew sugar cane, they grew rice. Some of these guys even grew rock goods, even, even growing corn, they'd come to them from the Americas early on. Portuguese brought it over from Brazil. They grew potatoes that came out of Brazil by the Portuguese to West Africa. They had good, good agricultural skills. The people were known as being good farmers, good with horsemen, good with horses, and good with cows and all this kind of stuff. They were desirable people in this mercantile system. And folks, they stole them. They sent these armies into these, into these villages. When nighttime came, they shot fire into these villages with the bows and arrows. And they sat there and watched these folks living a normal life before they attacked them. In the evening, they came in from their work. They washed their faces. They washed their hands and feet. Some of them took baths. They cooked their dinners. They had grandmas and grandpas who took care of the children. A lot of you guys had your grandmama who took care of you. 
when mom and dad were working. They watched these folks eat, enjoy themselves, saw the, saw the little kids playing with their puppies and with their cats and other animals, monkeys and so forth. And when the last fires were extinguished and people went to bed, they attacked them. And you had no idea what was going on. And you got your kids up out of the bed and got your old folks out of the bed before the house burned down on top of you. You ran out of those gates trying to seek safety. You ran through the gates, they had, they had wooden clubs and they knocked you out. They pulled you to the side of the savannah, to the side of the river, or maybe to the side of the jungle. And here they tied you up. The next morning, those young men of Europe who got a job out here would go through and plunder the villages. They'd look for gold, they'd look for silver, they'd look for ivory. That was their payday. They tortured the leaders of the village trying to find out where the gold was located. I look at Ventura Smith. He was eight years old in Africa when they attacked his villages. They tortured his father, the chief, to death Wonder where the gold and silver was. Ventura Smith comes to America and he learns how to read and write and he writes the story of his life. This is the 1770 time period. Without these stories, we wouldn't know what ever happened out here to these folks and what took place. The next morning, they dug through all those looking for items of wealth looking for a little bit of payday out of, these, out of these camps, out of these villages. They lined up the people. The folks who were too old to be sold were shot on the spot. They genocide them. The little kids under the age of three who could not make a voyage across the Atlantic Ocean, they cut their throats. They took the ones who were healthy, the ones who were sellable, and they marched them back to the slave forts. And sometimes they marched two or three weeks with little water and little food. And these young men who weighed 180 pounds would be down to 120 pounds once they arrived in the forts. And here they started feeding them fish, cornbread, potatoes, trying to fatten them up, get them healthy again. And when that slave ship arrived with the order on board, they went down into the book of runes and they found those 15 young girls and those 15 young boys. They brought them up to the office up there. They went through and processed them, gave them numbers, made out the insurance forms, and then they branded them. They're either branded on the buttock, the shoulder, or the upper back. Wherever the owner of the, of the Slaves wanted them branded. And then they were carried to the ships. These ships were designed to carry about 120 people in normal passage. They had totally gutted the interior of these boats and they had built decks that were six foot apart. Six foot heights between the decks. And the ones who were pre-sold were put on the upper decks of these boats. Before the boats left, they filled them full of folks, hoping they could sell these folks at slave markets across the Caribbean. These boats could hold 600 people. I want you to imagine this, guys. You have no water faucets. You have no bathrooms. You have no toilets. And that boat pulls out in the middle of the night, heads, heads up toward, toward the Cape Verde Islands, and makes its way across the Atlantic Ocean, heading toward Barbados. The trip takes three weeks. I'm telling you, find the hurricane routes. Every morning, there are people who have died on board that ship. Some have died from dysentery. Some have died from the flu, the flux, with the lungs filled with fluid. They took these folks off, the, off to the top of the decks of the boat and threw them overboard. From the 1660 time period until the 1804 time period, the 1808 time period, the sharks in the North Atlantic patrolled this region. They knew where the food supply would be. 20 million people left Africa on slave ships. Only 12 million arrived 
in the Americas. Eight million people were thrown overboard from these ships. It looks like Hitler's Holocaust. Each morning, the ones who had been pre-sold were brought up to the top of the decks. And here they were bathed in salt water. And we've got that old burning scab over here from that branding iron. That salt water hurts pretty bad going on that open wound. They go through and they try to feed you a little bit. They make you dance around the decks for a little bit for, for, for some exercise. And back under you go. When you arrive in Barbados, the ones who are pre-sold go off the boats to special holding areas where they are fed given some medical attention. The ones who are not pre-sold go to the slave auction blocks. They're stripped down. They're handled by these men who are gonna bid on them. They go from person to person, from mouth to mouth, checking teeth, checking the mouth of the people, and then they check the rear ends for, for hemorrhoids and for other hernias and this sort of thing. They go through and fill women's breasts. It's horrible. Little kids are crying because they're being molested by these old white men here to go to the slave blocks. And then they're bid upon. If you're sold in Barbados, you're given to your owner and off you go to the plantation. The ones who are not pre-sold are put back into the bowels of the ship. The ones who are pre-sold are reloaded and they head off to Haiti. Or to Prince just down below Miami. They might stop a time or two along those islands like St. Martin and down toward, down toward Jamaica, I mean, down toward Puerto Rico and on over to Dominican Republic and then Jamaica. And then they are up to uh, Haiti. And then they're pre-sold again. The ones who are pre-sold get off the boats. They're fed and have medical attention. The ones who are not, have not been pre-sold or go to the slave auctions again, they're sold. The ones who are not sold go back on the boat, they reload, and they head up to Charleston. When they arrive in Charleston, the boat is in quarantine. That sound familiar? They're in quarantine for a week to make sure these boats do not have smallpox or any diseases that could kill the people who live in Charleston. A physician comes out to the boat to treat these people to make sure they are in good condition. A lot of the folks have not been well fed during this time period and they're bleeding from the rear ends. They have intestinal problems. You can't sell a slave with their bleeding from the rear end. So they take rope and put hog lard and stuff these slaves to stop the bleeding. Humiliation of all of this. Then they rode them into port the ones who were pre-sold were put in special areas to be fed for a few for a few days and get kind of get kind of beef backed up a little bit and more relaxed and so forth. The ones who have not been pre-sold go to the slave auction blocks. The old ship's captain goes into the to the agent's office and fills out the insurance papers. The ones who have died, he gets paid for. He didn't lose any money off the trip. I read a story about an old of old ship's captain. There in Charleston, they had a whole ship load of people who had smallpox, over 400 of them. And he threw the whole cargo overboard into shark infested waters, sailed on into Charleston, and got all of his money back. Didn't lose anything. Genocide all these people. If you're not pre sold in Charleston, you're given to a second rate slaver who will put you on a wagon and carry you around the countryside trying to sell you off his wagon. These are the ones who are sickly and too poor to, to make it. He has one or two he can't sell along the way heading home to Charleston. He comes to a big hole in the road and he shoots them and throws them in a gully, in a gully somewhere. He goes back to Charleston and gets his money. Okay? So that's how come slave trade started because it's the cheapest way to obtain labor. A few days later, the old guy in Charleston who's, oh, who bought these people are sent word that his slaves have arrived, and he sends his large wagons down to pick up those people. These large wagons will hold four tons of goods, and they're called trucks, T-R-U-C-K-S, a term we still use today. And he takes these folks back to his plantation. In Thursday night's lecture, I'm going to talk about the plantation and what happened to these folks who brought in from Africa who are sick and how they try to take care of these kids and get them well so they can go to work. 
going to discuss all of that here next week. So y'all remember, they're looking for cheap labor, and their Royal African Company was England's answer to cheap labor. Okay? They also are going to provide money to help stimulate the economy. We call this stimulus money. Okay? They're going to give money to industry, to shippers, to mercantile people. They'll give them loan money to your large owners of plantation so they can produce more goods. You're going to stimulate your economy by handing out money. What are we doing right now, guys, during this virus? We're handing out money to everybody. Families get so much money, you're going to get another, another check probably toward the 1st of September and so forth. This is called stimulus money, trying to keep the economy going and growing to build a new economy in this case here. In our case, trying to rebuild the economy today. That's part of it. Then you're going to have tariffs and duties on imported goods. When those Finnish goods left England and came to North America, they went to a counting house, a custom house, if you will. And here they put a tax on all the goods coming into North America. You never knew how much tax you were paying on your goods because the goods were taxed and the price of the goods was added to it. Like you guys, got, like you guys buying gasoline. How much tax do you pay on gasoline? You have no idea. Because the gasoline is in the price of your tax is inside the price of your gasoline. That's what's going on here. Okay? The American people become upset because they're being ripped off from the custom houses, from the tariffs and taxes that England is imposing on them. They get so mad, they go into a revolution. It's all done because of taxes and tariffs. That's part of the way to build your economy. Your federal government or your royal government in this case, will make their money from tariffs and taxes. Okay? Then you're going to have armies and navies to protect your trade routes to keep people from stealing from you. When the British Navy came to North America in 1776 to make war against the American people during the Revolutionary War, England had a thousand ships in its navy. They brought a hundred thousand red coat soldiers to North America during this time period. That's unheard of. A navy of a, of a thousand ships was, un, was unheard of during this time period. The British Navy had it. So your, so your trade protection came from your army and your navy. Then you pass laws and legal codes to support your economic growth. You had all kinds of custom laws. You had laws that dealt with your workers. You had laws that dealt with the labor. You had laws that dealt with competition. All this was all part of this here. And then, of course, you brought in various kinds of navigational, navigational acts, uh, navigational acts that's going to make sure the British are not interfered with by the Dutch, the French, the Germans, the Russians, the Spanish, or the Portuguese, and even the Italians. You make sure that these foreign countries do not interfere with your trade. If the Dutch wants to trade with North America, the goods must go through England and be taxed. Then the goods leave England, these British, these Dutch goods leave England and come to Virginia where they're retaxed again. So you're paying two or three taxes on your goods that come from France, Germany, Spain, and other countries that go through England through these navigational laws that come place, they come a place here. And then part of the dumbest thing they did of all was they put royal governors in charge of your colonies. These royal governors did not respect the American people. They looked down upon them. They were cruel to them. They were mean to them. Old Governor Tyron, North Carolina. If you made him mad, he'd go through and burn down your farm, burn down your house, and kill your wife and kids. He was a tyrant. So a lot of the problems with the American Revolution is going to come from tyranny from your governors that came from England who do not respect you, and it's going to come from the Custom House who's ripping you off on taxes on the goods you're purchasing. What's going on here, guys? 
You've got to create your enemies. Mercantilism did this to the colonial Americans. They put all the they put all the weight on, on mercantilism on the backs of the American people and on the backs of slaves. They're the ones who did not do well. Okay. Now, guys, in 1685, King Charles dies, and his brother, the Duke of York, takes over. He is called James the Second. James the Second. James the Second is going to try to bring back the Catholic rule. And the British people go after him. They decide to kill King James. King James disguised himself as a woman and fled to France. He pulled the old RuPaul trick, guys, went across the channel, and they didn't know he was gone until he was gone. Disguised himself as a lady to get across the channel. And the search was on trying to find a descendant to take over the empire. And they found William of Orange and his wife, Mary. Mary was, was, a, was a grandchild of King James I. And they brought her and him to England to rule. It's called the Rule of William and Mary. In Virginia, in the 1690s, they built a college. They finally got to building a college. It is called William and Mary. Okay? One of, the, one, of the, one of the greatest universities in, out in Virginia is William and Mary. Some of you guys need to look at that college too to go to. That's where that's where Thomas Jefferson went to college at William and Mary. Okay, they did have one child, and her name was Anne. And Queen Anne never married. If Queen Anne had married, and had a family, there had never been any German kings but she did not marry. During the time of William Mary, they're going to pass several important laws. One is called the British Bill of Rights to give the British citizens personal freedoms, civil rights. Okay? They're going to also pass what is called the Act of Settlement. The Act of Settlement is going to say that if there's nobody to take the place of the king and queen of England or the king or queens of England. They will look to the German house of Hanover for the next kings, for the next royalty. Sophia of the house of Hanover was also a grandchild of King James. Mary does not, Anne does not marry. And when she dies, in 1714, when she dies, here comes George I of the House of Hanover to rule England. King George I cannot speak English. He only speaks German. Okay? They have passed a rule here, guys, that no Catholic can ever gain the throne of England again. That they're going to be a Protestant country and that they shall not be touched by the Catholic Church ever again. There'll be no more wars over religion. Okay? Well, that's kind of interesting to look at also. All right. So here comes King George. King George is going to live until around 1725. When he dies, his son, King George II, takes over. He rules until about 1765 or 1760, and then his son, King George III, takes over. And, of course, George II and George III do speak English. They're English kings. You know, Queen Victoria was of the House of Hanover, and she ruled England in the 1800s, very popular queen of this time period. But when World War I broke out and the British people were fighting the Germans in World War I, they decided the House of Hanover was too German for the British people. So the house name was changed. The House of Hanover became the House of Windsor. Windsor sounds more British than Hanover. So in World War I, they went through and changed the name to the House of Windsor instead of the House of Hanover. Okay? All right. 
How many of you guys seen a movie called 1917? You guys get a chance, y'all go rent that movie and watch about World War I. I was blown away by it. I'm going to go, I'm taking it home tonight with me from the library. I can watch it again. It's a pretty good movie called 1917. And do watch the, the, uh, the little short uh, items that comes with it, the little narrative parts that come with the movie and see how they film that movie. It's pretty realistic for a World War I movie. A lot of my older folks have really enjoyed watching that movie out of the library. Okay, we come back on Tuesday, on Thursday night, and I'll make sure this time Blackboard is open. That's just me being dumb, not paying attention. And we're going to discuss the colony of Georgia. We're going to cut, we're going to discuss the French Gulf Coast and do some local history. And then we're going to go and discuss the culture of North America. And y'all get you ready for your first exam that's due on Sunday night at eight o'clock. That exam has been opened on Blackboard. You can start tonight working on it if you want to. You can wait till tomorrow or whatever. But do take your time on it. Spend a little bit more time on your true false and make sure you do use your chronology on all this, on that true false particularly. I got a lot of the questions off the true false part of the test. Okay, now you guys are on your microphones and talk to me. Y'all got right. any questions? None here. None here? Y'all doing okay out there? We're good. Did y'all stay up with me okay tonight? Yep. Did y'all watch the did y'all watch the recording of last week's lecture? No. Well, I got it on there. I'm gonna put it on here here. I'm gonna have to download. It's gonna take about two hours to download all this. But it'll be on there tomorrow. Tonight's lecture will be on tomorrow. So any of your friends in the class who missed tonight's lecture, tell them it's on it's on Blackboard that they can rewatch the lecture tonight. And uh and also on on Thursday night, if you have any test questions that give y'all problems, y'all let me know what they are and I'll help you answer them. Okay. Okay. All right. So yes, you're on that test a little bit. You should be in good shape. All right. All right. It's time for some dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right. You. We'll see y'all later. If y'all need Bye. anything, follow at me. Bye, guys. Bye. Y'all have a good Bye. evening. Bye. 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 You too.